Hey guys, here's a look at my latest find. It's an early 7 inch black and white TV made by Motorola in the late 40s. It's a model VT71. I found it on Craigslist and uh, went out to pick it up last night in the western suburbs. Now I do have another mahogany VT71, but there's a subtle difference on the outside and that's what intrigued me about this set. Here's my other one that I restored a while back. And see this channel control here? It's got an outer knob for selecting the channel and an inner knob for fine tuning. But this set has three identical knobs, no fine tuning. I had heard about this variation of the VT71 but never saw one up close before. Uh, apparently this is the very early version of it. If we look underneath, there's something else kind of interesting about this set. On the bottom of the set we've got a large cutout here with an aluminum tray and the original label. So we can see it's a model VT71 chassis TS-4. That's what intrigued me. There were a lot of variations of the TS-4 chassis variations B, C, D, E, and so on up through J and there were even two versions of the J chassis early and late. This doesn't have any letter which is an indicator that this is the original TS4 not one of the later variations. The other interesting thing is here this has channel 1. These were meant to be inexpensive sets. In fact, the big selling point of this set was that it was the first TV available for under $200. Uh, it actually sold for $199, so <laughs> just under $200. So one of the ways they save costs was that there uh, is only eight positions on the channel selector. So let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, eight positions. But of course there are more than 8 channels. There are channels 2 through 13, um, but actually this set is old enough that there was channel 1 through 13. And the way they would set this up is you always get channel 1, you always get channel 2, and you always get channel 7. Now for the other 4, or rather 5 slots, you would contact your dealer and they would set those tuning slugs up for your area. So you would either get channel 3 or 4, 5 or 6, and so on, to fill out the 8 channels. Channel 1 was never really used. Uh, it was phased out of the standards by, I think, 47 or 48. So any set that's got channel 1 is definitely a very early set. On the back here, Something else kind of interesting. There's a number on here, 2425. I believe that's the serial number. My other Motorola sets have numbers that are well into the hundreds of thousands. So if that really is a serial number, this might be the 2425th VT71 to be produced. I'm not quite sure about that. Overall, this set's in pretty good shape. It's got a wooden cabinet with mahogany veneer. There are a few chips here and there. Uh, this is the largest one here. But I think I can strip this down and patch those in. Uh, luckily all the chips are towards the back side. The plastic face plates in quite good condition. A few minor scratches, but those can be buffed out with Novus. There's certainly no cracks in it or anything. Grill cloth looks to be in good shape. Now as far as this mush you see around the CRT, that is very, very common. They use some early type of synthetic foam to cast this rubber, or to cast this mask that goes around the CRT. And those melt literally with heat and time. So every set I've seen is like this. Now luckily, somebody found one that was in good enough condition to make a mold out of it, and you can buy reproduction masks. And that's what I've got on this set. So, when I restore this, I'll definitely pick one of those up. It's also nice to have the original bottom tray with all the metal snaps to cover up the tuning slugs. And, best of all, it's got the metal back. Quite often these are missing as well. 
So the only thing that's really missing on this is the power cord, but I've got plenty of spare, so that's not a problem at all. Oh, and uh, one last problem is that <laughs> somebody put masking tape on this years ago. It looks like it might have been through a garage sale or something like that. I asked around online and got some tips on getting this tape off, and I'll give that a try. It's really kicked on there well. More about that later. What I want to do now is get the back of this set off because I have not uh, taken a close look inside yet. All right, here it is with the back cover off. And there's a tube chart over there on the side. Now a few things struck me right away because I have worked on several of these sets before. I'm familiar with their insides. Number one is I've never seen one of these sticking here before. <laughs> and there's another one further back in there. What these are are high voltage capacitors. 0 0.03 microfarad at 6,000 volts. By way of comparison, I pulled out another VT71, and as you can see, it's just open space here. It doesn't have that capacitor. Something else is the picture tube socket. Here it's got a nice uh, real plug on the base of it, whereas this one has individual leads just pushed on. Again, these were <laughs> economy sets and they saved money wherever they could. Also, this one is copper plated and they painted it black where the capacitors are. This one is just all bare steel. Ballast tube may look a bit different, that's what this guy is, but originally this set came with a metal one too and I replaced it with this superior amperite glass ballast tube. I'll try to do the same on this set as well. This may still be good, but these are notorious for going bad. The one I, that came with this set did work for a while, but eventually one of the elements burned out. The problem is that all these are, are coils of wire like you'd find in a toaster, supported on a mica frame and they're just exposed to air. All these do is burn off heat. There are uh, some aspects of the circuitry that, uh, that need to dissipate a lot of power, and that's what this does. These guys are also made from coils of wire on, mounted on insulators, but they're inside of an inert gas, uh, inside of a glass envelope. So, with no exposure to oxygen, these leads don't burn out. Or as these do. Something else that's different, I can see from the tube chart, is up here for the mixer oscillator, they actually use a Loctal 78F type tube. You can kind of see it way up there towards the speaker. Whereas all the later sets used a little 9 pin 12AT7. Also, this has a couple knobs for horizontal and vertical hold. This does not. And you can see this is a TS 4H. Also, it's uh, got the UL seal of approval. That's Underwriters Laboratory. That means it, it meets their safety guidelines, whereas this does not have one. It may have at some point it fell off. Can't say for sure. All right, I will remove the screws from the bottom now and pull this chassis out and let's see what it looks like underneath. The chassis came out quite easily. First I had to disconnect the pitcher tube because it actually stays behind inside the cabinet. Then I had to disconnect the speaker, pull off the knobs, and remove four bolts. And here it is. As I hoped, it looks to be in really good condition. No missing parts. Here's that 7F8 local oscillator mixer I was referring to earlier. And something else I noticed that's odd and primitive looking is this high voltage cover here. On later sets, it's this nice stamped, rounded aluminum box. On this set, it's more of a crude rectangular box that's made out of folded over metal and spot welded together. 
all the screws were missing on this. <laughs> there should be 10 of them around the base and then one nut on top to hold it all secure. I imagine somebody was servicing this set, probably replaced that high voltage tube and never bothered to put them back in. So this, this is a bit different than the other sets I've been showing that use flybacks. This uses a 25L6 beam power tube uh, that's fed from the horizontal oscillator as I recall and that powers the primary winding on this um, high voltage coil then it gets rectified by this. And this little spring gizmo here is to provide feedback to the oscillator. So down here we got a primary with oh I don't know maybe a few dozen turns and then a few turns here to provide the filament voltage for the rectifier tube and then thousands and thousands of turns here to make the high voltage. Alright, uh, let's take a look underneath. Huh, it's not what I was expecting to see. Not bad, just not what I was expecting to see. See, there's a little piece of paper down here. I'm not sure why. Oh, I guess that would have gone over this. Maybe there were some issues with this tuner wafer switch rubbing against the chassis. Huh. <laughs> well, this is probably all original. Well, I see, I think. Well, I'm not sure. The reason I'm confused is that I have another Motorola set um, that is all original and all of the capacitors are Motorola branded. But in this set they're almost all solar branded. Although some of them also say Motorola. So maybe Motorola outsourced their capacitors to solar? I'm not sure. couple more high voltage caps under here which is strange and the later sets all the high voltage caps are down here and they use a much smaller transformer for this section too all right now for the nerve-wracking bit I've got to test the picture tube these seven JP fours are hard to find and when you do they're usually quite expensive so I really hope this is good there aren't many testers that can test it because it's quite a bit different than your conventional picture tube because this is electrostatic so it's far more like an oscilloscope CRT than a television CRT. Luckily I've got a Suncor CR70 but even this uh, doesn't list the 7JP4 in the setup guide but luckily I found someone online who has a different, uh, I think, older version of the CR70 and it was listed, so I was able to pick out the settings here. So, as you can see, for CRT type, they actually list it as a scope. And there's all the various settings. So, got it all hooked up, we're ready to go. We'll turn it on. Set the filament to 6.3. Well, it's hard to tell. The filament's even glowing because it's got this big mounting bracket all around the neck of it, and then it's got a shield, so I cannot tell. <laughs> Plus, there's a lot of light in this area, and uh, Whatever light might be emanating is just too feeble, so I'll have to rely entirely on what this device tells me. No shorts, no shorts. Let's go to emissions. Alright, we've got emissions. And we've got very, very good emissions, it looks like. So that is fantastic. Let's see, I'll set the cut off here. Yeah. Got grid control. Excellent. 
Uh, that's testing really, really good. Like new old stock good. <laughs> I just pushed the emission life test and that barely even moves. Eh, moves a bit, but then again I've only had this tube turned on for a minute or two. If you recall, I picked up a new old Scott, a new old stock 7JP4 from that old TV repair shop, and this test's about as good as that one did, which is even more amazing considering how old this set is. But it's hard to say if it's the original picture tube or not. It's Mark Sylvania, but you know, then again, Motorola didn't make their own picture tube, so it's going to have to be some other brand. The reason I think it's the original is the mounting there. It's all uh, in quite good condition. He's using a really wacky mounting system where it's uh, a wooden block going to up into the cabinet and then a metal U clamp going around the neck of the picture tube. And in between that and the glass neck, they have some padding and then some crumpled aluminum shims. In sets I've seen where the picture tube has been replaced, it's usually uh, a mess in here because the person who replaced the picture tube didn't take so much care in getting that clamp on there so cleanly. Same with the shields, because these things are a real pain to get all set up. Alright. Yeah, I've looked as while I've been talking, this tube has been warming up even more, and now the life test is even better. Alright, that is fantastic. So, uh, I guess the last thing I'll do in this video is try to get this masking tape off. So I asked online for suggestions on how to remove masking tape that's really set up hard on an old lacquer finish. Now the key to this is you don't want to use any solvents that might attack lacquer. And if you're not sure if it's lacquer, then there are some tests you can do in an inconspicuous area. First, uh, test to see if it's shellac by using some alcohol, because alcohol will dissolve shellac. And if you want to make sure it's lacquer, use some lacquer thinner. And again, in a very inconspicuous spot, because lacquer thinner will melt right through lacquer quite easily. Well, I, I know that this is lacquer, just from the vintage and from other sets I've worked on. So, first thing I'm going to try is isopropyl alcohol, which will not attack lacquer. And I was, it was also suggested that I try ammonia. So I've got this glass cleaner, which contains both alcohol and ammonia. And uh, I can try some lighter fluid, which has naphtha in it. And there's also mineral spirits. Gradually, this window cleaner is actually getting it off. I've just been letting it soak in for a while and going over it with a fingernail. Be careful not to dig too hard. And slowly but surely, it is all coming off. Or even the actual right to bring the claim. I got the bulk of the masking tape off using the glass window cleaner, and now I'm down to just the gummy residue, and I'm using the isopropyl alcohol on that. And slowly but surely, it is coming off. Alright, after about 15 minutes of rubbing and scraping, I got all that crap off. Now I'm going to take some Howard's Restore Finish Mahogany and some very fine steel wool and see if I can spruce this up even more. Now really this does need to be refinished at some point, or at least have some clear coats of lacquer applied to it because it's starting to flake off and I also noticed that somebody would scratched some stuff in here looks like some initials and some numbers maybe a phone number something like that and of course there's a ch there's uh, some chips of veneer right down here in the corner but for the time being certainly uh, this will spruce it up here it is after the Howards after I applied it with the steel wool, I let it sit for a few minutes and then wiped off the excess, let it dry a while, and then buffed it out. And it's looking pretty good, but uh, 
After it dries out a bit more, I'm going to go one step further and use this Howard's Feed and Wax, which is beeswax and orange oil. And that's what they recommend on the Restore finish. And finally, here it is after the feed and wax. Now, it's still hardly perfect. You know, plenty of scratches and gouges and so on, but it looks a heck of a lot better than it did. Eventually, what I think I'll end up doing with this cabinet is instead of refinishing it, I think I'll try to put some layers of lacquer over this finish and kind of blend it in and see if I can get rid of some of these scratches and such without having to refinish the whole thing because it's not that bad and refinishing it as you've seen in my recent videos is quite a bit of work I've been doing some research trying to figure out exactly what version I've got and what year it might have been made in this is a Wallace Tellier compendium of early Motorola TV schematics and the very earliest set that I've got is a Motorola TS-4B and this does not match what I've got. It's close in that I do have a 6AL5 and 6SQ7 in the audio amp but this does not have those large high voltage capacitors in it. And there's a few other differences as well. Something else I noticed that's odd on this set is that there are no caps down here. Every other VT71 I've seen, there's a cap here you can pop off and a set screw on either side. You pop those caps off and take those screws out to remove this lower piece of the frame and then you can take off the plastic bezel. This doesn't have any. It's nice and clean and I actually like this look a lot better which makes me wonder why they moved away from it. Now as to how do you get the front of this set off, well, they simply put some screws on the front. So you take this screw out and this and this and so on. So in other words there's an extra piece here. On the other sets um, they don't have this thick piece of, uh, it seems like masonite or something. So maybe it was another cost cutting measure. With the set screws on the side, you don't need this piece of masonite. <laughs> I don't know how much money that would have saved, but uh, I definitely like this look better. Here are those caps on my other Motorola sets. So there's the metal cap installed, and here on this mahogany set, you can see it removed. I've been doing some more research and I believe I finally tracked down the info for this set. I found it in my rider's index here and they do list the TS4 chassis and it's in volume 1, which I do not have. But luckily the early television foundation has scanned it and here's page 1. Now as I scrolled through this and looked at the schematic and so on, it didn't match my set specifically the audio output circuit. Let's see. Yeah, this has a 6S8. 6A U6, then a 6S8, and a 25L6. My set has a 6A U6, then a 6AL5 for the ratio detector, and then I think it's a 6SQ7. So, it doesn't match this. But I kept looking and looking and looking and right near the back I found out that there was a TS-4 late revision. They didn't change the model number for the chassis but it is different. So this is the early and here is the late. Zoom in here. This has the 6AL5 and the 6SQ7 
and it also has the high voltage caps down here so this as near as I can tell matches what I've got Now something else I did is I looked up on my other sets and found some online and found the manufacturing dates, the serial numbers and the chassis model numbers and put together this little list. So my set's up there top and bold, TS-4 serial number 25, 2425, no idea what the date is, and then there's the other set. So I think it's pretty conclusive that the serial, that number on the back really is the serial number and that this really is a TS-4 and it's a very early version of the VT-71. Although, <laughs> now let me look at the schematic more closely. The high voltage caps on this do not match what I have. They've got .005 for the vertical and .005 for the horizontal. And that's not what I've got. I've got 0.03 for the vertical. Hmm. All right. Well, <laughs> let's see. Now here we are back on the early. And the er TS4 early does have 0.03 caps. So mine seems to be half of a TS4 early and half of a TS4 late. So <laughs> maybe let's call it a TS4 middle version. I don't know, but <laughs> I'll have to do even more research, I guess. So that's another reason why I'm holding off and working on this set. Of course, I'm in the middle of a bunch of other projects, but also I want to find out exactly what I've got before I dive in and start replacing any components. So I guess that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video on a very early Motorola VT71.